Fred, thank you so much for joining us and, and being willing to, to be our first person today. You, we have just an hour, and you have so much to share with us, so we'll, we'll, we'll get started right away, and we'll try to cover as much as we can during our time. You were born in Germany in 1928, five years before Hitler came to power, and a little over 11 years before the Second World War began. Before we turn to life under the Nazis and your family leaving Germany, let's start first. Tell us a little bit about your family and you in the years before Hitler came to power. Before I <coughs> excuse me, answer this, I need to clarify something. There are lots different types of survivors. There are survivors who survived the extermination and concentration camps. They had the worst of it. There are survivors like myself who were taken out of their own environment and uh, their future was changed because we had to leave Germany and go to a foreign country whose culture and language we didn't know. And there were some survivors who were not that many who were hidden by Germans and others from the Nazis during the whole time of the war. I belonged to the middle group. I didn't, fortunately, we, I did not get go to the camps. We had simply had to leave Germany. We went to South America as refugees, and that changed, of course, changed our life. My parents, what was the question about? A little bit about your family and community before Hitler okay. came to power. My parents owned a, lived like ordinary citizens. They owned a factory um, that made rainware, which was unique and important enough that when the Nazis, the army and others stopped buying from Jewish businesses, they kept buying from my parents' um, factory because what they, what they the manufacturing was so unique and so important. The, otherwise, it was simply the normal life of German citizens. Um, they considered themselves good Germans, Jewish religion, but nevertheless, they were Catholics and Protestants and they were Jews. And uh, they were just like ordinary Germans until Hitler came and pointed out that they were, quote, not ordinary Germans, but they were harmful and uh, whatever else. Fred, in so, the place where you lived, Konigsberg, how large was the Jewish community there? There were about 5,000, never more than 5,000 Jews in, in, in the city. Mm -hmm. It was a relatively small city, and um, um, the Jewish community never amounted to more than 5,000. By the time I was born, there were probably only 3,000 left, 3,000, uh, 2,800, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. People left. People left because Königsberg, as you had seen on the map on the far uh, uh, eastern corner of, of Germany, people wanted to go to Berlin. There was more doing in Berlin. Berlin was a more cultural city that offered more opportunities. So some Jews in Germany left, uh, in Königsberg, left to go to Berlin. But others who saw the danger of the Nazis coming actually left Germany. And um, I went to a Jewish school, which was founded in 1935, I believe. And every Friday afternoon, we had a uh, social hour, if you will, for the students. And I remember that practically in every one of these, there were some people, some children, we said goodbye to because their families were leaving Germany to the United States, to Palestine, as it was called at that time, or other countries, you know, wherever they, they could get a visa. So um, it was, it was an, a diminishing, a diminishing community. The Jewish community was a diminishing community because people left. Before we turn to the events after Hitler came to power, your father was a veteran of the German army, right? Yes, he was. A, veteran of the German army, and surprisingly, with all the anti-Semitism in 1935, he got a recognition and an order or something for 
for his um, fighting in the, in the uh, First World War. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, I mean, uh, you wouldn't have expected the Jew to get that, but they did. he did. He did. You, you started school in a, in a public school, an old boys public school in 1934, the year after Hitler came to power. That was a rough year for you. Tell us about well, that. Well, it was a rough year in the sense that I was bullied. I was the only Jewish child in the, in the, in the school. I was bullied. At one point, point I, was being, I was beaten by one of my co-students. Teachers didn't intervene. How could they protect a Jewish child in, um, in a Christian school? And um, after, during, that, during that year, the Jewish community founded a Jewish school. For those of us who had been in, in, in German schools and could not continue there, now, I have to say that my brother, who was older and was in a school, an older school, continued in, in the German school until we left Germany in 1939. And uh, he never had any real problem. It was in my class. These were six-year-old children. And they already had been indoctrinated enough, probably by their parents, to the to tell them that Jews were no good. On the other hand, there were some children in my class who didn't participate in that. So the question was, I couldn't be friends with them. I would have loved to be friends with some of these children, but I couldn't. How could they be friends with a Jewish child? And I never obviously found out why they were not um, aggressive towards me. But. Um, no limitations. You, you shared with me that, um, and as you said, they were indoctrinated already at six years old, including coming to school with Nazi insignia. And in each morning in class, they had to say Heil Hitler. Yes. And you, you did not participate. No, I did not participate. And this this well, obviously pointed out to everybody that I was not, right. not the same as, as, quote, everybody else. In, in fact, you wrote about that time that... Um, after a few weeks, it was clear to you that you were different, that you were an outsider. Yes. So as you said, you, um, you, moved to a, uh, you were moved to a Jewish school in, in Königsberg. Um, and Königsberg, you said, is, was especially virulently anti-Semitic, yeah. even more than maybe other places. Yeah, I have to tell you, the Nazi party had groups in every one of part, in many parts of Germany. And the head of these sections or whatever was called the Gauleiter in German, which is essentially a leader of the group. The Gauleiter in Königsberg was particularly virulent, particularly virulent anti Semite. And uh, so Königs, not every city was the same. As um, Bill said, I, I came to Hamburg, and in the nine months of my stay in Hamburg, I never, never, never had an anti-Semitic incident. Hmm. In Königsberg, I had an anti-Semitic incident practically every day. The children in, in, in the school, I don't know how they recognized me. Maybe we looked a little different. The children would run after me, and uh, they, they called, they insulted me. What, what was their insult? Their insult was Jude, Jew. They felt that wasn't that wasn't was an insult. Of course, you know it's you can look at it in different ways. But uh, to just call me Jude, Jew was they felt was an insult. And you said you said the Nazi Party was especially virulent, even as early as 1933. They were already had um, committed arson against synagogues well before Kristallnacht. Um, you told me that one of your, your own earliest memories was the May Day Parade, I think, of 1934. Yes, but not only the May Day Parade, but uh, parades practically every day. Mm -hmm. Young people would march through the st street, and what they were singing about is, we are going to kill the Jews, and then everything will be much better for Germany. That was a song they sang, and, and, and um, the first, first time in 1934, but all, all through my stay in Königsberg, uh, 
until 19, uh, beginning 1939, these kids and these young people marched through the street. Now, my, our apartment looked out on the main street of Königsberg, as did, by the way, the factory that my parents owned. So I saw that every day. And um, I couldn't help seeing it every day. They marched and, and, and sang these, of these terribly aggressive songs. And I guess we were, I was afraid. It's, it's, um, you, um, you shared with me, um, talking about your, the factory being an apartment being on the main street. In 1936, Hitler came to Königsberg and came down your street. Tell us about yeah, that. Well, he came and, and uh, drove through the main street and uh, down on the street there were actually SS Nazi officers and since our window or the window of the factory looked out over the street they asked us to let them come in and uh, see Hitler from where we were standing so we had a bunch of SS officers standing at our window uh, whether they realized we were Jewish or not, I don't know, and whether they cared or not, I don't know either. Mm -hmm. But uh, after Hitler passed, they left. During the time, um, Fred, that you, when you moved to the to the the Jewish school, that was a much better time for you in school. Wasn't Absolutely, it? The, the the teachers were very caring. Interesting enough, I thought obviously as a six or seven year old child, they were old people. In hindsight. The teachers were 20 years in their 20s. Mm -hmm. even, even the principal of the school was, was in his late 20s. So, um, but you know, as a child, you don't make that much of a difference between people who are in their 20s or their 30s or 50s. So anyway, they were very, very caring for us mm -hmm. children. And I felt safe, I felt secure, I felt, I felt easy. What was not easy was the walk from my, from my home to the synagogue where the school was located, the big synagogue, and you saw a picture before of the burnt out synagogue after Kristallnacht. And you know, there were kids along the street who uh, tried to bully me. But you know, they were young Nazi kids, indoctrinated. And, um, but the school itself was fabulous. I, I have absolutely not only no complaint, but I enjoyed going to school. It was such a safe place for us. Mm -hmm. Fred, in, I, th I think, I, I believe it was 1937, your parents had an opportunity, I believe, to emigrate to Chile, but they didn't. Wh why did they not leave if they well, had the chance? I'm not sure. I have to first say that my father, like many other German Jews, considered themselves Germans, period. And they did not see that the, the great danger, I mean, it was before the Holocaust, obviously. It was 97, 1937, 1938. But there, was a lot, there were a lot of anti-Semitic incidents, particularly in Königsberg. But my father was secure as a German citizen. He had fought in the First World War. <clears throat> he was just a Jewish, a German, a German with Jewish faith. So there was no particular reason for them to leave. Now, the, how the opportunity to go to Chile came along in 1937, I'm not sure. But I remember in our living room, um, my mother exclaiming, that is an earthquake country. I'll never go to that earthquake country. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, we ended up in Chile afterwards anyway, but um, she, she didn't want to go. So I guess she prevailed, and uh, we didn't go to Chile at, the time, at that time. As, um, as, as, as awful as things were for your family and other Jews in Königsberg, um, after Hitler came to power in 1933, things became far worse with and after Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, in November 1938 when Jews throughout Germany and Austria had their businesses vandalized, their homes ransacked, and synagogues burned. What happened to your family as a result of Kristallnacht? Okay, let me first say about Kristallnacht, Christ, Kristallnacht. A young Jew, who's a Polish Jew, who had been, whose parents had been deported from 
Germany back to Poland, shot an, an embassy employee in Paris. And when that man died, everybody knew something would happen to us. I'm sure the Nazis had prepared a pogrom. And uh, a couple of days afterwards, the pogrom happened. Um, they um, invaded our apartments. They invaded the stores. They broke, they broke into the stores. They uh, set fire to the big synagogue. And eventually, the fire was put out. But there were several other synagogues in the, in the uh, city. They were not set afire because they were close, in, close <coughs> integrated into, into neighborhoods. And had they been set afire, the neighborhood might have been set afire. So they were just, quote, destroyed. <coughs> Excuse me. They were just destroyed, but they were not set afire. Our synagogue was set afire. Because it, it stood alone. It stood, it stood alone, yeah. separate from, from other houses. Mm -hmm. And they could safely uh, set it afire. Mm -hmm. Your father was arrested that night along with other family members. Tell yeah. us about that. He was very lucky in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. Jewish men all through Germany were arrested and sent to concentration camps where many suffered from the cold, from the from the treatment. Königsberg, being on the far eastern corner, was too far from a concentration camp. And um, I guess the city had to finance the transport of Jews from Königsberg to the concentration camps. So they opted to put the Jews in jail. And uh, my father was arrested, like almost all the other men, and they, he was put in jail. Jail was a benign, benign environment compared to concentration camps. And uh, they stayed in jail. And um, in fact, the wives could bring blankets to them in jail. And uh, they were relatively speaking, relatively comfortable. They were released after s some weeks. And um, my father was such a good German that he said, that is the worst that can ever happen to us, so we are safe now. And uh, again, he, he would not have ever have left, uh, but for an, uh, something that you want me to talk about? Not, that? not quite yet. I was going to okay. ask you, arrested along with your father was a 14-year-old cousin, right? Oh, yeah. But I had a cousin. Well, m my mother's sister, her husband, and the cousin lived in a small village maybe uh, 50 kilometers uh, f distance from Königsberg. And they even arrested that 14-year-old boy, uh, because after all, he was also g guilty f of the shooting in, in, in Paris of that uh, German um, embassy employee. And um, he, he was, even the 14-year-old boy was in great danger. And, Something I want. My parents had arranged of, to send me uh, on a children's transport to England. England had opened its doors to children to save them. And I was on the list to go to England on that, um, on that program. And um, one day, I found out I was no longer on the list. Why? Because my cousin in a little village called Germau was in such danger that my place <coughs> on that program had been given to my cousin, and he went to England instead of me. Fred, you had, um, I know you want to talk about um, this. I, I was very <coughs> taken when I read in your book um, after Kristallnacht uh, with your synagogue burned that you, as a, a 10-year-old boy, several times went to the ruins by yourself. Um, it's very poignant what you wrote yeah, about the, it. Tell us about that. The school, the school was moved from the synagogue to the Jewish orphanage, which was right next door. And there was a fence between the Jewish orphanage and the synagogue. I found a hole in that fence. And I went through that fence, 
that hold several times to the synagogue. I never saw anybody else, no child, no child, no, no adult. And why I went, I cannot recall. It was maybe to say goodbye to the synagogue that had been such a home to us, but I probably went four or five times. What I found at one point, I have to explain to you what a Torah is. A Torah is a um, handwritten scroll of the five books of Moses. And every synagogue had at least one and sometimes more Torah scrolls. And um, during Christian Nacht, they were all taken out and, and strewn all over the synagogue. And the synagogue was, our synagogue was, again, not only burnt, but inside the auditory, the uh, place where we prayed and so on was all, all destroyed. The benches were overturned. And, and, but anyway, I went in there. And one day, and when I was in there, I found a small children's Torah. And I took it and kept it as a memento ever since. It's a, an important memory of, of my going to, the, going to the synagogue. Again, I never found anybody else in the synagogue. And you found it in the rubble. Right? I found it in the rubble. And um, I've, quote, rescued it. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I did. And again, it's important to me, and uh, it's, I've kept it ever since. Fred, after, after Crystal knocked and after um, uh, you, you weren't able to go on the kinder transport to England because your cousin went instead of you, your parents sent you and Manfred to Hamburg. Yes. Tell us what, what, why you went to Hamburg and, and what it was like for you there. And you said earlier that you, you did not experience any anti-Semitic events while you were there. Yeah, I, I said earlier that many the different parts of Germany uh, had different quote Gauleit as uh, head head of the party in, in, in that in the in that region. Hamburg had a Gauleiter who was not that actively active and anti Semitically. And I I I spent about nine months in Hamburg and I never ever ever had an an anti Semitic incident. We went to school, uh to the Jewish school, and everybody knew where the Jewish school was, and uh, the children knew. And I never, never experienced an anti-Semitic incident, so it was extremely quiet compared to my hometown, Königsberg. Y yet synagogues in, in Hamburg had also been burned during Kristallnacht. Of course, the yes. synagogues had been burned. Yeah. But um, in fact, next to the Jewish school, there was a burnt out synagogue. Mm -hmm. But I never um, went in there, and it was closed and uh, locked, locked up and closed, and I never, never went in there, but it, it had been burned out. And you were staying with family, friends in Hamburg? I was staying with, um, yeah, acquaintances mm -hmm. of my, they, my parents. So they took you in for that nine-month yes, period? Yes, yes. While you and your brother were in Hamburg for those nine months, what was, do you know what life was like for your parents? My parents had a, had a tough time in Germany. I, first of all, the factory, their factory was Aryanized, meaning the Jewish businesses were in general were sold to non-Jews, Aryans, and they were, they were sold, practically given away. They, the Nazis forced them to to give, quote, give away the, the factory. But in, for some reason, my father stayed involved. In what capacity, I don't know. But um, my father stayed involved until um, 19, mid-1939. And maybe now is the time to, to talk about this. Um, we had, they had an employee who came to work the, this, in the Nazi uniform, he was a Nazi, and of course you don't. The Jew doesn't fire a Nazi, so uh, he stayed on. And uh, it turns out that he had embezzled a lot of money, and he wanted my father out of the way. Now, after Crystal Night, the Jews were forbidden to have uh, firearms. And one day, this employee opened the safe 
in the presence of witnesses, and lo and behold, there was a gun in there. So uh, the man was called Meyer. So Mr. Meyer said uh, he would call the Gestapo and uh, tell them about this, and he did. And uh, my father is, was called uh, to the Gestapo uh, two, the, two days later. And interestingly enough, here was a Gestapo officer who said, I don't believe Mr. Meyer. I'm sure he, you were framed in some way, and you didn't put that gun in that safe. So instead of sending you to a concentration camp, we will give you some time to leave Germany. If you can't leave, why then, then you'll, you'll have to send you to a concentration camp. My father presented that problem to the Jewish community. They'd always been, my parents had always been great supporters of the Jewish community. And uh, the Jewish community now arranged for us to leave. And where were, the, where were they sending us, quote unquote, to Chile? And so mother's uh, thoughts, notwithstanding that she didn't want to go to that earthquake country, we, end, we ended up in Chile. And uh, it was because the Jewish community was able to arrange both the visas and uh, the passages on the, sh on the ship and so on. So we ended up in Chile. And uh, we left after the war had already started. Uh, the war started in September '39, but Italy was not in the not in the war. Be before and you go there, let me go back just a little bit, Fred, if if I can. Tell us um, when when you it finally looked like you were now going to be able to leave. Um, what did your parents do to to prepare? How did they prepare for you to leave? I know one of them is they had you and your brother start taking Spanish language uh, yeah. lessons. Yeah. What would they do? That, well, they, 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 pack it, they packed huge containers called, in German, called lift. And they packed two huge containers which were to be sent to wherever we went, to Chile eventually. And um, the lifts were sent to Holland to be stored until we, until we left and to be sent to after us to Chile, we never saw them again, and everything they ever owned was in those, in those two boxes, those two lifts, and um, we never saw them again. And uh, well, that's our lives got saved. And that's that's maybe more important than than having lost what was in those in those containers and those boxes. One of the things you wrote about Fred is that. Um, as you were preparing to go to Chile, the war broke out. So September 1st, 1939, at that point, you thought all hope of going uh, was gone. Yeah. And in fact, you wrote, you, I prepared for war. What, what did that mean? Well, first of all, let me talk of the 1st September 1939, okay. when, <clears throat> when Hitler declared war. I remember coming down from our apartment to a gas station across the street where there was a radio. And his speech was carried on the radio, and uh, lots of people were listening. And of course, I stood there too, listening. I didn't go to school that day. And uh, as far as <coughs> I was concerned, we would never leave Germany now. And uh, what my parents did, I don't know. I, um, we were, my brother and I were in Hamburg, and one day we got a <coughs> letter or something, a phone call maybe, <coughs> excuse me, to meet, to meet my parents in Berlin. I think it was October 39, because we were going to Chile. That's about as much as I know. We took a train. We took a train to um, Genoa in Italy, took the ship and went to Chile. But there's an interesting thing. My parents were not, we, you were not allowed to take out any money. I think we, for each of us, 10 marks, which, is, which was about two and a half dollars each or something like that. So like $10 total for the $10 family. total. But my, parent, my father had taken money and 
hid it, the, he hid it on the train. He went to the toilet on the train and hid it in the toilet, the bathroom, before we went to the border. So th the money was safely hidden there. And after, he, um, after the train passed the border into Italy, he went to the, the bathroom and retrieved the money. It's not riches, but we had at least some money to, uh, to start life, or at, at least to, to um, spend during the six weeks or so it took us to go from Genoa by ship to, uh, to Santiago, to you Chile. Italy, Italy was an ally of, of Germany. Was there any danger going through Italy as your, as your avenue for leaving? No, Italy was not yet in the war. But I remember on the ship, um, every night there was a huge Italian flag on top so that, uh, that if the Brits came and tried to bombard uh, enemy, enemy vessels, they knew that this particular ship was not an enemy vessel. It was a neutral country. At that time. It, Italy, yeah. Italy was, was neutral for, uh, for a long time. Well, for a long time, for several months several after months. that. And uh, again, we went out while Italy was still neutral. You wrote um, in your book, we were the last to leave. All those left behind were murdered. Did anyone you know survive? If I think of it, none of the, none of the people who were still there when we left mm -hmm survived. We never saw them again. Um, and these were, these were, I mean, from my child's viewpoint, these were my friends, my school friends, um, who, um, who, were, who were murdered. Of course, their parents were murdered too. Mm -hmm. Initially, <coughs> we didn't know um, where they had been taken, where they had been taken on a train and shot right at when they arrived or whatever. Later on, I found out where they had gone. And indeed, they, uh, they were shot right when the train arrived, where, and I think it was near Riga or somewhere. They were all shot when, um, when the train arrived. From what I know, what I understand, is that there were trucks waiting when the train arrived and uh, all the passengers, all the deportees were loaded on the trains, taken to a certain place, maybe uh, 20 kilometers away. And upon arrival, they were all shot. The graves had already been prepared, and um, they were all shot. Mm -hmm. Amongst them, some of my best friends. Fred, as, as a young boy, You've, you've left Germany, you're now on a ship, you're on your way to Chile. Do you remember what you felt, that you felt as you left there? And at what point did you have a sense of, I am truly safe? When, when did that happen for you? Well, while I was in Königsberg, I was always afraid. I had nightmares every night, and always the same nightmare. There, was, there were some dunes, and they would fall on me. And, asphyxiate me. When we left Germany and we came to Italy and st stood on the ship that would take us to Chile, I was, at that point, I was safe. I knew I was safe. I no longer had any nightmares. Um, I was, my dreams were just like any normal child's dreams. And at that moment in Italy, on that ship, I felt safe, and um, uh, I guess that answers the question you have. Mm -hmm. when, when did I feel that, um, that I was, quote, saved? Mm -hmm. And um, indeed it was. I mean, when we came to Chile, it was very, very, very difficult. Think of this. My parents, at that point, were already in their 50s. They didn't speak the language. They didn't know Spanish. They didn't know how to earn their living. And um, they came to a country. They didn't know what their future would be. As it turned out, uh, somebody from the Jewish community in Santiago waited us and others at the, um, 
port in Valparaiso, when we got off the ship, they took us to, <coughs> they accompanied us in Santiago to a, to a place called in, in Pension in German. It's a place where you live and get, get your food. And this whole place was, all the people in that place were immigrants, just like us. Now, what do you do for a living? The Jewish community in Königsberg, in, in Chile, in Santiago, had made some provisions in that they, uh, I guess, gave my parents some money and supported us during the early time in Chile. My parents almost immediately wanted to start working, and they opened a factory, so-called, for women's wear. The factory were two sewing machines, right in our, we got one room in that pension. We got one room for me, my brother, and my parents. And almost immediately after two or three days or four days, big, a big table was installed and two sewing machines appeared and a machine to cut, to cut the cloth. And they started making women's wear. So the factory and our living room, our bedroom, were all in the same, same room. You know, as a child, I accepted it. You don't really ask many questions, but I imagine what must it have been for my parents who had, who had been in Germany, not wealthy, but they were good, good upper middle class. And now suddenly they were in this one room all four of us in the fact, so-called factory, all in, in, in one room, what must it have been for them? I mean, their lives were saved, clearly. But the Holocaust hadn't happened yet. They didn't know that what would have happened to them had they stayed in Germany. Uh, it must have been terrible for them. I mean, in, in hindsight, as a child, I was, what, 10, 11 years old. I didn't realize it. But now, as I grew older, and we're thinking about how, how they must have, what it must have been for them. It must have been terrible. You know, again, they were in their 50s. They were not young people anymore. Uh, when I was born, my mother was 42. So she, by this time, she was 52 or 53. My father was three years older. It must have been a terrible time for them. Fred, you, um, you shared with me that you have some letters that were written to your parents from the, some of the folks you knew, family members in Germany. Say a little bit about those letters. The letters came both from the family who had taken us in in Hamburg, me and my brother, and friends in, in Königsberg. And they became ever more terrible. Basically, what they wrote is, we are poor, we have no money, we don't even have enough money for postage anymore. And uh, certainly, they had no money, hardly any money to eat. And uh, they became really, really ultra poor. When our family, uh, when this family in Hamburg wrote, we can't write anymore because we don't have we don't have money for the postage. And another family in Königsberg wrote the same thing to my parents. Now there was a little girl I had played with um, all the time. Uh, again, remember I was ten, eleven years old. She wrote a letter to me in Chile and wanted an answer. I never answered to this day. Uh, I feel guilty. She was murdered like everybody else. Um, but I simply, again, as a child, you, you disregard these things. And I never answered this letter, which, I mean, the parents, her parents, or her mother, she didn't have a father, her mother wrote to my mother, to my parents. And then she included a letter for me twice which I never answered. And, uh, you know, 
this is now like what? Many, like, like many boys, that's how many boys. Sure. I mean, this is now about 70 years ago. Right. I still feel guilty. Fred, you, um, as you said earlier, you, you, you left Germany six weeks after the war began. Do you, do, do you know of anybody else who left Germany later than you did and got out? No. Well, I think I did. There were friends of my brother, two young women who maybe at the time were 15 had gone to Berlin. And uh, already before, maybe around Crystal Night or so, they went to Berlin. And I think they, they left Germany after we did. They left Germany. But they also the only people that I know positively that they left and were able to leave from Berlin. Good. In I fact, we, they lived in New York, and my wife and I visited them um, once. Once when we got the address and we found out where they were, we visited them. But to the best of my knowledge, they got out after we did. And, and speaking of your wife, do you mind sharing with us how you met Sue? Yes. Chile was very interesting. And we came to Chile, and we almost immediately joined, uh, we, my brother and I, joined a group of German Jewish children. The group vaguely had some ideas that perhaps we would go to Palestine eventually. Remember, Israel didn't exist yet. And from, and my, my wife equally joined that group. And we, I met her about four or five weeks after we came to Chile, when that group had a party or whatever you want to call it, a children's party. And, and I met her right at that point. About 11 so we, years we old. Were, we were 11 years old. <laughs> but what is important in Chile was that this group that, that just was to take care of children eventually became dogmatically Zionist. And uh, it bec first of all, it was very, very left. It was a very politically very left. And secondly, is that we were expected not only go to go to Palestine, but go to a kibbutz. And some of you may know what a kibbutz is. A, it's a, it's a, a collective farm that belonged to this particular movement. And uh, we became very involved in that, in that movement until, well, we started going together when we, when we were about 17. And uh, we both became a little sick of the dogmatism the, of, of, of this particular movement, Very, this leftist, ultra-leftist, ultra ultra-Zionist uh, dogma of the, and we left, we left the movement and uh, went, came to America on the way to Palestine, or maybe by that time it was Israel already, and uh, thinking that um, we maybe we would we would learn something here to earn. We would still wanted to go to Palestine, but live in a city. We wouldn't go to this kibbutz um, that was part of the of this uh, movement, Zionist movement. And we came to we came to America, thinking we would stay what six months or something like that. Well, that's what seventy odd years ago. I guess you're staying. And we're still here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we came, actually, we knew when we came to America that we would have to earn our living. And we got an immigration visa. So we were legal, so to speak, to earn our living. At that time, again, I have to go back to that. German citizens in Germany were not were not given visas to, to America. Why? Because they were presumed to have been Nazis and, and they were blocked from coming to America. So when we applied for our visa in Chile, you apply as a German, we were Germans and not as a Chilean, we had absolutely no problem in getting a visa. The, uh, uh, 
it's almost Im immediately we got a V visa for, for America. After a few weeks after we applied and got our visa, suddenly the State Department decided that all Germans were allowed to were uh, able to get American visas, and the quota was totally, totally f f uh, filled. It's people, a friend of ours who um, in Chile who also wanted to do what we did, she applied when the other when Germans already were admitted to 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 America, and um, she had to wait years for her immigration visa, to, uh, to get an immigration visa. And for us, it was what we waited a couple of weeks, m a month maybe. So um, it, it was easy for us to come. And um, we came here, and we thought we would stay for, what, six months or whatever it was. But um, I have to tell you something. We were born in Germany, Nazi Germany. We lived in Chile. Chile was was a democracy, but not not entirely. And uh, we were always, like in many uh, Spanish-speaking countries, we, we, we remained gringos. We were outsiders, always, for the whole time. And then we came to America, and we were we were accepted here like, like everybody else. Nobody called us a gringo, nobody. Uh, America was open, open to, to, to foreigners, to immigrants. It was, America was an immigrant country. And we felt comfortable. We felt we were really, truly, if, it's, if I can use that word, seduced into staying here because America was such an open, wonderful, open country. And this is how we stayed. There was no reason, um, to, no reason to leave. We felt, we felt at home practically the first day we came here. Well, not the first day, obviously, but uh, you know, after a, f a few weeks, after a few, two or three months, we felt at home. So there was no reason to go anywhere else. Well, we're glad you stayed. I can tell you Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> Fred, um, uh, I think we have time for just a few questions from our audience, if we, you'd be willing to take a couple. Absolutely. We have microphones on, on both aisles. We ask that if you have a question, um, please wait till you have a microphone. Make your question as brief as you can. Um, I'll repeat it just to be sure that we all hear it correctly, and then Fred will respond to your question. And I ask if you will stay with us through the questions, because we're not finished with Fred quite yet. Uh, he's going to have some final words to say to us before we close. So do we have anybody that, that has a question? Well, there we go. We have a question right back there. Of the friends that you um, lived in Germany with, uh, did you, after the war, did you meet up with any of them? Did any survive, to your did, knowledge? Did to your knowledge, did any of your friends from your youth survive? And if so, did you ever have a chance to meet with it? None of my close friends survived. Uh, some, again, these two women who were my, my, my um, brother's friends, somewhat older, we met them here again in New York. Met them. But of my really close friends, not one of them. So, well, I have to correct that. There were some Jews in Königsberg who survived, and they were half Jews, full, full Jews, meaning having both Jewish parents. None of them survived. Uh, some of these, quote, half Jews, having one Jewish and one non-Jewish parents, did survive, and we met them. But they had not, they were, I knew them from before the war, but they were not close friends. Of my really close friends, not one of them survived. All right, thank you. We've got a couple questions down here. Here comes the mic. All right. Thank you for being here. Can you speak to forgiveness? Can you speak to forgiveness? I, the question, how do you, how do you feel now? How, yeah, how okay. was there anger? Um, did you come to terms with your story? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, as it turned out, I, I worked for the American government. And since I spoke German, I oftentimes went to meetings with, between the Americans and Germans. And they were always older people, my age, and the younger people. 
the people my age, I asked myself, what would you have done to me had you met me in, in, you know, in, in before the war? The younger people were all, they all knew why I always was the only one on, on, in the delegation who spoke German. And the younger people always knew why I spoke German, who I was, and so on. The older people also knew, but, but I had no contact with these older people, and I didn't want any contact with them. I avoided them. The younger people who were very sympathetic, um, I made friends with some of them. And um, after all, they had, nothing, had had nothing to do with what the, what the Nazis did to us. And uh, so the, the answer is yes and no. My people my age and older, I avoided. I never, in these meetings, these were always uh, group meetings, I never had any contact with any of the older people, except, again, with the younger ones, and I made my good friends. I have to tell you something, which is a little to the side. When the Germans came here, we in normally we had some social life with them. We invited them for dinner or whatever it was. And likewise, when we came over there, they invited us. Um, at one point, they came here, and I asked one of our friends, the, one of the young people, it's Sunday, uh, if we have nothing to do, come, we go to the swimming pool, we have dinner. And then I said, if one of your colleagues uh, doesn't have anything to do, bring him along. And he brought along one of these older people. And that person came to us finding himself at home with Germans, immediately talk, talked about the wonderful things Hitler had done, the Autobahn and all these other things. Now, I, I was the head of the project. I couldn't kick them out. That would have been a <laughs> diplomatic incident. But you can see it answers your question why, the, why we had I didn't have any contact with the older people, except for this one time when it so happened that I could avoid it. Um, my younger friend eventually took this older person aside and told him where he was. And that stopped, it stopped these uh, admirable uh, exclamations about what, what the Nazis had done and Hitler had done. I think we take one more question. We have a gentleman right here, and then we are going to close our program. Okay. So you had said you were bullied in school, um, and your brother, that didn't happen. But outside of the things that happened with the factory and the arrest, did your parents experience abuse while you guys were in Kronigsberg? The question is, um, outside of what you described about uh, bullying, did your parents and, and what no, happened? No, I don't think they had any physical abuse, if you will. So. Um, the older people, the older people were not like the children who didn't really know basically what they were doing. And um, of course, you know, the, the, their factory was taken away, and uh, this issue with the gun in the safe was obviously an attempt to to destroy them because this man who had embezzled all this money wanted my father out of the way. Well, he got my father out of the way, but not the way he thought he would, because it, my parents were such good Germans, they would have never, never, never left. It was only after this incident, this, this man who tried to destroy us by calling the Gestapo because of that gun he had placed in the safe, saved our lives, because at this point, the Gestapo told my father, you have to leave, because otherwise you go to a concentration camp. So the, the idea of destroying and getting rid of my father and my family uh, resulted in the exact opposite, because it saved, it really, really, really saved our lives, because my, my parents would never have left otherwise. Mm -hmm. So, so, our lives were saved by this man who had uh, embezzled, by this Nazi who had embezzled all this money from the factory. 
Thank you, Fred, and thank you all for your questions. Um, hold on just for a moment. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up, and, and then Fred's going to wrap us up uh, with some closing comments. I want to remind you that we'll have programs each Wednesday and Thursday until the middle of August. So we hope you might come back and join us. But if not, the museum's website will have information about first person for 2018. Um, when Fred is done, it's our tradition at first person that our first person gets the last word. So when Fred is done, he's going to leave the stage and go back out the, up here where he's going to be available to sign copies of his book, Loss and Restoration, Stories from Three Continents. So he'll be out there. And you, if you talk to him, then you'll have a chance to ask him a question if you didn't uh, have a chance to do so today. And when Fred, also when Fred's done, our photographer, Joel, is going to come up on the stage and take a photograph of Fred with you as the background. So we want you to stay put. Uh, because that'll be a really nice uh, picture for Fred to have uh, um, after he's done today. So um, on that note, um, Fred. OK, I have a couple of things I would like to say. First is the fact that I had to leave my, we had to leave our home in, in, in Germany and uh, immigrate to Chile and eventually to America. I think it was a terrible thing, but I think it broadened me. It broadened all of us who went through this intellectually because we, we came with German culture and then we acquired for us Chilean culture, but other people in, in other countries, their culture. And for us, coming on the third immigration to, to America, we acquired American culture. And uh, I think as individuals, it broadened us. And the other thing is, in spite of what the Germans did to us. I think I, and of course my wife too, we had a good life. Uh, Chile was good to us. Um, America was good to us when we came here. Uh, it, it, it accepted us as full individuals, and not as gringos or whatever else. And I'm very happy that we were able to come to America and live our life here. That's about my own. Thank you, Fred. Thank you.